to our series, Route 66, and I want to welcome our Kuwaita and Sepulpa campuses. I want to welcome our online viewers. I'm glad you're along with us on this uh, series that we've been doing and are going to continue through this year. Route 66, it stands for the 66 books of the Bible. We're going through every book of the Bible this year. And we had two uh, kind of uh, uh, ideas, two goals that uh, we wanted to accomplish when we started this. And they go back to kind of the idea of people uh, driving on Route 66. I mean, part of the appeal of, of, of Route 66 was this idea that you could go out and you could explore the heartland. You could see downtown USA. Uh, not only that, you were the one that jumped behind the wheel. You grabbed the wheel and you drove. You were an active participant in that. And so along with that, two kind of uh, goals that we've had is one of those is that we would see the heart of God, that we would see what God is up to as we go through the page pages of this collection of books through the biblical account. And so as we do that, I hope it'll cause you to explore even more and study on, on your own and, and to find out the, the heart of God. Uh, the second thing is uh, that God has been asking his people all along to participate with him in his plan to redeem creation. And so it is an active invitation for us to be a part of what God is up to, to actually grab the wheel and to, and to participate and partner with God uh, in God's story. And that is certainly the case when we get into the book we're going to study today. Book of Ezra is where we're at. If you want to turn there, if you've got something that you can follow along with us, it's only 10 chapters long. And so it'll be easy for you to kind of flip through. We'll look at a few verses, but I always love it when people are either uh, looking through their uh, device that contains their Bible or, or flipping through the pages of their Bible. Book of Ezra was originally a part of a multi-series or a multi-part of books that included First and Second Chronicles. That was kind of part one. And then Ezra and the book of Nehemiah were uh, together. And so it was a multi-work series there. But uh, later on when the uh, scholars, Jewish scholars before Jesus came along, uh, uh, divided it up, they, they separated it into the book of Ezra. Ezra was the one that traditionally, they believe, wrote all of those particular works. And so let's just kind of catch up with a little review here. After King Solomon was king, the nation split into two kingdoms. There was the northern kingdom called Israel, and there was the southern kingdom called Judah. Remember, the, it was the southern kingdom that was the actual line of David. The northern kingdom was the one that kind of God had rejected. And so it's the, the, the nation of Judah now that we're actually kind of following along with. The northern kingdom was conquered by Assyria. Then the Assyrians were conquered by the Babylonians. And then while the Babylonians are kind of the world power, they come and they conquer Judah, the southern kingdom, and they exiled the Jews to Babylon. They destroyed the temple. Remember, we talked about that last week. It was a big part of First and Second Chronicles. Solomon building the temple and everything that led up to that. And now here we are just a few years later and the temple is destroyed. And it is destroyed uh, and then some 47 years later, uh, a, a Persian leader named Cyrus the Great is going to move against the Babylonian Empire, and he is going to take the city of Babylon. And so no longer is it Babylonian Empire, it's Persian Empire. And that is the point in history in which Ezra kind of helps us or, or starts right there. In fact, let's look at Ezra chapter 1, verse 1 and, and 2. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, remember that's where we are world history-wise, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. So something's happening here in the background that was prophesied by Jeremiah. We haven't yet gotten to his book, but he'll have a book that we'll talk about a little bit later. So to fulfill the, Lord, to, to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, 
Notice also, God is working in the heart of this world power leader named Cyrus. Uh, he moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm. So he's going to speak something, but it's also important that we notice here, it's going to be important as we get later in the story, also to put it into writing. So he's putting something into writing. You know, this is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of earth. Wait a minute. I. This is the king of Persia. This is not the king of Judah, the king of Israel. This is, not, this, is, this is a pagan king who is now saying, yeah, the God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he's appointed me of all things, listen to this, to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. I mean, that's just the craziest thing that this Persian pagan king now is saying, uh, yeah, the God of heaven, the one true God has instructed me to do this. By the way, he's given me all the kingdoms that I have, and I'm going to build a temple for him. That is an amazing turn of events that we cannot overlook because what's going to take place is the exile is going to come to an end god's people who've been exiled in babylon now conquered by by the persians that's going to come to an end the jews are going to start returning back to judah and jerusalem the temple is going to begin to be rebuilt and somehow this pagan king named cyrus is excited to be a part of it and excited to, to participate in it. In fact, here's what he does as you read along. He's going to return some 5,400 articles of silver and gold that King Nebuchadnezzar, remember King Nebuchadnezzar of the Babylonian Empire? We read about him. We'll get to him when we study the book of Daniel. But uh, that king had, had taken those articles from the temple and brought back to the Babylonian temple. And so King Cyrus is going to return all of those things. He's going to call for an offering to be taken up so that, that the temple can be rebuilt and so it can be restored. And he's putting it all in writing. It's going to be documented. In fact, Ezra says the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus to fulfill what Jeremiah had written. Well, what are we talking about? What, what did Jeremiah write? Well, years before the temple was destroyed, uh, before Babylon came to power even, certainly now before Persia came to power. Listen to what the prophet Jeremiah wrote. This whole country, he's talking about the area, Jerusalem and the area around, it will become a desolate wasteland. That, that had to have been surprising words to people that thought everything was going fine. And these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years, but when the 70 years are fulfilled, I will punish the king of Babylon and his nation, the land of the Babylonians, for their guilt, declares the Lord. So what we're finding in Ezra chapter 1 is that things are beginning to fulfill exactly what had taken place uh, years before that Jeremiah had, had prophesied. This is what's going to happen. The temple's going to be destroyed. The area's going to become desolate. Everybody's going to go to Babylon. After 70 years, they're going to come back, and God is going to punish the Babylonians, and he certainly does that through the overthrow by the Persian Empire. And so after King Cyrus makes this proclamation, some 50,000 of the most devout, most earnest Jews are going to pack up from the city of Babylon and they're going to move home. They're going to pack up their things and they're going to go home. The problem is their city is destroyed. It lay in ruin. And so most of them uh, move out to some little outlying town. But in chapter 3 of the book of Ezra, it talks about how they begin to rebuild the altar so that they can make burnt offerings. In fact, this is the first part of them rebuilding the temple, and we begin to see their sense of pride, their sense of joy, their sense of heritage is all beginning to, to come back again. In the meantime, kind of on the world front, King Cyrus of the Persian Empire is going to die in battle, and a new king is going to be put on the throne. While that's taking place, chapter 4 of Ezra tells us that the enemies of God's people that are around Jerusalem and in Jerusalem begin to fear that they're uniting again. They're coming together. They're rebuilding the temple again. They're growing strong again. And so they try to frustrate the work effort. If we can kind of stop things, slow things down, then maybe they'll lose that sense of pride and joy again. And when that doesn't work, they decide that they're going to send a letter to the new king falsely accusing the Jews of rebellion and, and, and revolt. 
And so this new king, months later, is going to receive the letter, and uh, he's going to do a quick Google search of the archives, and he is going to find out that Indeed, the people of Judah have a long history of revolt and rebellion. And so he orders the work on the temple to stop, to stop by force if necessary. So the rebuilding of the temple comes to a standstill for some 14 years. Now, we read about it a little bit, but we read about it in some other places. The Lord is going to use two prophets, one of them named Haggai, one of them named Zechariah, and he is going to uh, use them to rise up and inspire the people to keep building. Now, it is Haggai, in fact, both of these guys, Haggai and Zechariah, prophets that have books uh, that we'll get to and study uh, of their own. But it's the book of, uh, it's Haggai that is going to eventually write to the people and say, this is the word of the Lord. He goes, you have these nice houses, but you've let the house of the Lord come to ruin. And so uh, in their guilt and, and uh, uh, in that comparison, they decide that they'll, they'll begin building once again. And once again, the opposition takes notice and they ask them, who authorized you to start the rebuild again? And they say, well, King Cyrus did. And so those that are concerned about it send a letter to the new king. His name is King Darius. He's in his second year of office now. And they say, hey, this is what's going on. The Jews are rebuilding the temple again. And they say they have permission from King Cyrus. So King Darius searches the archives and he finds a decree written by Cyrus the Great. And in the decree, remember Cyrus has it not only proclaimed, but he had it written down, uh, Ezra chapter 1 verse 2. In that proclamation, it ordered not only for the construction of the temple, but pledged to pay all the expenses from the royal treasury. In fact, this is the letter that King Darius sends back. Do not interfere with the work on this temple of God. Let the governor of the Jews and the Jewish elders rebuild this house of God on its site. Their expenses are to be fully paid out of the royal treasury. Don't, don't stop them. You, you let them do this very thing. Let them rebuild. And by the way, the, the royal treasury for that particular area of the empire that you guys are enjoying, it's going to go to the temple being rebuilt. Whatever's needed, young bulls, rams, male lambs for burnt offerings to the God of heaven, wheat, salt, wine, olive oil is requested by the repeat. All of that must be given to them daily without fail. Whatever they need for their sacrifices, whatever they need for their you know, supplies, whatever they need, make sure that they get that so that they may offer sacrifices pleasing to the God of heaven and pray for the well-being of the king and his sons. I mean, he's, he's getting something out of this. Furthermore, listen to this. I decree that if anyone defies this edict, a beam is to be pulled from their house and they're to be impaled on it. Not only is King Darius saying, this is, this is what's going to happen. You're going to let them rebuild and we're going to pay for it and don't stop them, don't keep them from doing it. But if anybody does stop them, there is the threat that, well, the threat of death, you know, by pretty gruesome action right here. And so the temple is going to be completed with the financial assistance of the very people who tried to stop it. Now, only God can do stuff like that. The crazy thing is, here we are into chapter 6 of the book of Ezra, and we haven't even heard from Ezra really at this point. In fact, it's about 60 years later that Ezra is going to join the story with the second wave of exiles, the people, second group of people that are returning from Babylon back to, to Judah. Ezra is a descendant, a direct descendant of Moses' brother Aaron. Remember, he was the original high priest. And so uh, uh, Ezra is going to come with, with that kind of, of lineage. He is a respected teacher. Chapter 7 tells us a little bit more. This Ezra came up from Babylon. He was a teacher well-versed in the law of Moses, which the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. The king had granted him everything he asked for, for the hand of the Lord, his God, was upon him. So Ezra is somebody that knows the word of God. Uh, he's well-versed in it. He's evidently well-respected. He's got great favor with the king and 
God has certainly had his hand upon him, and the king is going to give Ezra permission to go with about 7,000 other men, women, and children to go back to Jerusalem. And he gives Ezra the silver and gold to use for whatever he needs to on the temple. And he even encourages Ezra to teach the people the wisdom of God. That's amazing. This, another pagan king now being used by God, even instructing Ezra to teach people the wisdom of God. Why is it that Ezra had such respect and such favor from this king? Well, I don't know that we can answer that, but just a couple of verses later, we're told that this might be the reason, for Ezra had devoted himself to the study of the law, to the observance of the law of the Lord, and to teaching its decrees and laws in Israel. So Ezra is, is passionate about something. In fact, much stronger than that, he has devoted himself. He has made this the priority in his life. It's kind of a threefold thing that has to do with the Word of God, the plan of God, with, with what God is up to in the world. That he would first study it, that he would know it, and that he would also observe it, he would obey it, he would practice it, and then he would teach it or he would share it with other people. That's kind of his, his ambition in life. He's devoted to doing those things. And so that, that becomes kind of a, 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 a life uh, uh, goal for him. And so Ezra is going to arrive in Jerusalem with his entourage. And, and what does he find? Well, he finds that his people have intermarried with the neighboring pagans in fact, that was the very sin which resulted in idolatry that led to their downfall. Listen to this in chapter 9, verse 2. And the leaders and the officials have led the way in this unfaithfulness. I mean, this isn't just the, the normal people. This is, this is the leaders of the people of Jerusalem. And because of it, Ezra is distraught. He tears his clothes. He pulls out his hair. He pulls the hair on his beard. All of that is kind of a, a sign of grief and, and uh, uh, just uh, angst and, and uh, 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 repentance over, uh, over sin. Now, the intermarriages of the leaders and these officials were probably more than just, you know, they fell in love with some pretty looking girl who just happened to be from the wrong you know, a group of people. It, it, it's bigger than that. Uh, the, the intermarriage that God was always concerned about was that it would lead his people astray, that it would lead his people into idolatry. They, he was always concerned about them marrying the people who were idol worshipers. That's what God was concerned about. But even this was bigger than that. It wasn't just that, that these people wanted to marry. Likely what's going on is because of the opposition that's taking place is that some of these leaders are marrying as a sign of a peace treaty. Uh, they were doing it for the sake of promoting some peace. I mean, that, that's often what has happened in our world, that the leaders and the offspring of leaders among nations uh, intermarry uh, so as to preserve peace between those two entities, those countries. And so what's, what's happening here is that's, that's what God's people are doing. They're trying to promote the peace. They had good intentions, but they were trying to solve their problems on their own. And now this example has caused others to sin and it's brought some pretty destructive consequences to them. And so what we read about is that the evening sacrifice, Ezra is going to fall before the altar and he is going to weep, chapter 10 verse 1, while he's praying and confessing and weeping and throwing himself down before the house of God. A large crowd of Israelites, men, women, and children gathered around him and they too wept bitterly. And it's almost as if Ezra starts this revival of prayer and devotion to God, of repentance before God, of seeking God's faith. I mean, the nation repents is what takes place. And it just shows us what happens when, when one person puts their attention, turns their face upon God, turns and puts behind the things of this world. Well, it's an amazing period of history for the Jews. And it all began... Remember, with how the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus. How does God do that? How, how does God accomplish? How did he get a pagan king so eager to help his people? Well, we don't 
know all the specifics of that, but it's really not that abnormal. As we read through the scriptures, we just find that it happens again and again, that God seems to have a way of making those things happen. In fact, I've worded it this way. God has a plan and orchestrates unlikely people like uh, King Cyrus, a pagan world empire king, an unusual means to accomplish that plan. I mean, not only did he use King Cyrus, but he provided everything that they needed. King Cyrus says, we'll take care of it. Just write a check, put it on the empire uh, credit card, whatever, whatever they need, we'll take care of it. It's going to come out of the royal treasury. Hey, by the way, we're going to take up an offering. Everybody give towards the tent. I mean, this is an amazing thing. This is something that is only by God, how God has provided all of this, took, taking care of all of it. And it's just kind of unfolded, God providing. The book of Daniel ends about 10 years before King Cyrus appears. And Daniel tells us that there were devout Jews who were employed throughout Babylon. Remember, this is the Babylonian Empire before uh, King Cyrus and the Persian Empire came along. And so there's these devout Jews employed all throughout Babylon, even in the palace. And so when Cyrus came to power, maybe one of those Jews, maybe even the prophet Daniel himself, came trembling with excitement to show this new king in power, Cyrus, a prophecy from the book of Isaiah that had been written some 200 years earlier. Listen to this. Isaiah chapter 44, written 200 years before the events that we just talked about. This is what the Lord says of Cyrus. Calling him out by name, he is my shepherd and will accomplish all that I please. He will say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt, and of the temple, let its foundations be laid. It goes on in the next chapter. This is what the Lord says to his anointed to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of, to subdue nations before him, to strip kings of their armor, to open doors before him, so that gates will not be shut. I will go before you, I will level the mountains, I will break down the gates of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I'll give you hidden treasures, riches stored in secret places so that you may know that I'm the Lord. I'm going to do all of this, King Cyrus, so that you may know that I'm the Lord, the God of Israel, who summons you by name. 200 years before, calls him by name, says this is what's going to happen. But it's also for the sake of Jacob, my servant, of Israel, my chosen, I summon you by name and bestow on you a title of honor. And so God is telling King Cyrus 200 years ahead of time, this is the guy that's going to do this, and I'm going to give him incredible power, and I'm going to give him incredible strength, and he's going to conquer kings and nations. And God has this all under control because that's what God does. God has a plan, and he orchestrates unlikely people and unusual means to accomplish that plan. And sometimes we get concerned and we get worried about the events of world history and how it's all coming together. And sometimes I think we just need to remember that God has a plan and God is working behind the scenes and he is making things happen. Can you imagine what King Cyrus must have thought when he first was shown this ancient writing written 200 years before his time he just come into power can you imagine him being shown that and and what he thought about that well we actually know what he thought because we read it in Ezra 1 2 because this is what he said the Lord the God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth he's anointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem and Judah King Cyrus got that he, he understood this is this is all from God. This is God that has given me this ability and this power so I can, I can do something for him. And so this same God who called this pagan king Cyrus to, to have him do great things, can you imagine the incredible things that he wants to have his people do? The incredible things that he calls his people who are on mission with him and who are partnering with him to do, asking those that are actually believe in him. And, and what, can you imagine the amazing things that, that he wants to call those of us who 
call upon him, what he calls us to do. Remember what we learned about Ezra? Ezra chapter 7, verse 10. Ezra devoted himself to the study and observance of the law of the Lord, to teaching and decrees and laws in Israel. And so there were some things that, that Ezra is devoted to that have to do with God's plan, God's word, God's revelation of himself. Ezra, he studied it, he, he knew it, and he also then was a practicer of it, and then he shared it with other people. And so while God has a plan and he orchestrates unusual uh, situations and means and unlikely people to accomplish that plan, God also has a plan. And his people are faithful in knowing, obeying, and sharing that plan. Uh, Notice the emphasis here on all three of those things because what we have done, what we've tended to do in, in church is to say we, we need to know God's Word. We need to study God's Word. And let me tell you, if you're not there yet, one of the greatest things that you can do is to become a student of God's Word. That doesn't mean you've got to go to a Bible college. It doesn't mean you've got to take class. It means that you open it up and you begin to study and meditate upon it seriously and you do it every day. But you've got to be careful that we don't just study it just to know it, because Ezra avoided that pitfall of just knowing God's word. He he got it completely. He understood the complete picture here. He knew God's word so that he could practice God's word, so that he could also share God's word. In fact, that's the thing that Jesus was most concerned about, were people that would know the word of God, but not practice it. And so he told a story about it in Matthew chapter 7. You know it as the story of the wise and the foolish builders. They both built houses. And the difference, Jesus says, between the wise man who built his house on the rock and the foolish man who built his house upon the sand, uh, they both heard the word of God, but it was the wise man who put it into practice. They both heard it, but it was the foolish man who refused to obey it. In this case, Ezra is the wise one who not only knows the Word of God, not only hears the Word of God, but obeys it and goes beyond that, and he shares it with other people. Listen, if you're one of our Bible uh, teachers, if you're one of our Ridge Group leaders, one of the things that is key for us as a church is not just downloading biblical information to people, but In our study of God's Word, we always want to conclude with a couple of questions. How are we going to obey this? Because it is incomplete without our practice, without our obedience of that. And the other question that we've been asking most recently is, who are you going to share this with? Who can you share this with? That was the story of Ezra. It was somebody who not only knew it, but he he practiced it, he observed it, and he, he taught it, he shared it with other people. That's the complete person of God. Let me ask you this question as we conclude. What if, what if you believed God had a plan and that God was at work behind the scenes and God was using people and means and God, God was using whoever he wanted that evil people couldn't thwart it, you know, evil empires, evil nations, things that we hear about, all of those things that distress us and cause us concern that, that God in fact is using them and God, God can make things happen however he wants to have them happen. What if we believed that? That, that God was at work, that God had a plan, and God's plan is coming together, and God is using whatever means and whatever people he needs. What if we really believed that? And what if we really believed that God wanted to include us? And that our part in that was to get serious about knowing who God is through his written word, and that we get serious about practicing it, that we're sincere about it, that we're not just people who... Who, who speak the truth, but we, we practice it, we live it, and, and it becomes real to the people around us. And then we're, we're gladly sharing it with other people. If we believe those things really, wouldn't it change the way that you looked at life? Wouldn't it change the way that you lived life? It did that for a guy named Ezra and an entire nation of people 
back in, in, in Judah, in Jerusalem at a much needed time. And they could see how God was at work and how God was using them. And God changed the world through them. Pray with me. Father, thank you for teaching us through your word today, especially through the word of, of your man, Ezra. God, I'm thankful for his faithful example, his, his example of looking into your word and, and, and practicing your word and sharing your word. God, thank you for the reminder that you're in control and you're working behind the scenes and that, God, you, yeah, you, you cannot be overrun or overruled by the evil in this world and and God, we're grateful for that reminder. Help us to be faithful to you, God. Help us to remember our partnership with you in this world. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.